Uh, buenos dias, everybody. Um, thank you for coming through this afternoon. Uh, my first time in Madrid and uh, first time at Big Data Spain, so really excited to, to be here today. Uh, today, we'll be talking about productionizing machine learning pipelines with the portable format for analytics. So I'm uh, Nick Pentreath, ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a principal engineer at IBM where I work for the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, or CODE. I'll talk a little bit about that team in a moment. I focus on machine learning, data science, and AI applications, uh, and I have a, a long history in the Apache Spark project where I'm a committer and PMC member uh, of that project. I've written a book on machine learning with Spark, a little bit out of date now, uh, and traveled around the world uh, speaking at various conferences and meetups on machine learning related topics. So I mentioned the Code A team uh, within IBM, um, and when I joined this team, it was known as the Spark Technology Center. And it was founded by IBM to focus on the Apache Spark project and the uh, kind of surrounding ecosystem. Um, and it's a purely open source team working out in open source in the community. Uh, everything we do is in the open. Um, and more recently, the focus of the team really evolved to encompass not just Apache Spark, but the entire end-to-end -end enterprise AI lifecycle and all the technologies uh, that are part of that. So we aim to make it easier to uh, create, deploy, and manage AI applications in the enterprise. Um, and that involves focusing uh, on, still on projects like Apache Spark, uh, but increasingly the Python data science stack, um, including Pandas, Scikit-Learn, um, the deep learning libraries, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, uh, Cafe, and so on. And a couple of other projects, the Model Asset Exchange and the Fabric for Deep Learning, uh, which I'll mention you know, just at the end. But today, uh, we'll talk about one of the other important aspects of this lifecycle. Uh, that we focus on, and that's model deployment, and in particular, open standards for model deployment. So the machine learning workflow is, uh, as we all know, really simple. You start with data, you do some machine learning, and you profit, right? We can all go home and we've done our jobs. But in reality, this is a really complex workflow, um, and it spans teams. So you do start with data, that's true, um, but that data can be sitting around in various data stores um, across formats. Some of it is historical, some of it is arriving you know, in real time in a, in a sort of streaming uh, fashion. And that's normally the domain of your data engineers who are managing various data stores, metadata, uh, cleansing, uh, all of that kind of thing. You then need to ingest that, the, that data in various formats into the, the core data science and machine learning um, and research workflow which is all about starting with data pre-processing, visualization, you know, exploratory analysis, uh, trying to find out what are the properties of this data and what can we use it for, how can we join different disparate data sets together, um, then moving to the feature engineering and feature extraction, uh, and then into the, the part of the workflow that everybody obviously enjoys the most, which is you know, model training and, uh, and development and model selection. And that's a sort of workflow within a workflow, um, constantly tuning different types of models and pipelines and selecting the one that is going to perform the best uh, on the particular you know, uh, business problem or use case that we're dealing with. And then we hit the, the, the end of that uh, piece of the workflow, and that's where a lot of the, uh, the typical discourse on this topic stops. Okay, once you've got a, a model, you're done. But really, you need to deploy that model into some production environment, into some application to do anything useful with it. Um, and that is normally the domain of your machine learning and production engineers who are running live systems 24-7, um, high availability, high throughput. They care about performance and uptime. So as we'll discuss a, a little bit later, this is not just about deploying machine learning models, but actually machine learning pipelines. You have to worry about versioning, uh, lineage, tracking uh, all, all the, the input features and parameters that went into that, uh, that model that's deployed. And then once it's in the live system, predict on new data, monitor and, uh, the performance of the model and create and gather feedback, which then goes back into your data store effectively. That feedback is used to retrain models or update models. Um, and that, that is again arriving in, in real time and is stored in your batch systems. So this workflow is, has a lot of moving parts. It's, it's really much more complex than, than the common perception. And it involves all these disparate teams uh, working together with very different goals um, in mind. And that workflow, and in particular the, the, the data science kind of sub-workflow, spans tools. So every data scientist, the machine learning engineer, 
um, researcher and so on, has their own uh, favorite tool, whether it's R, Python, you know, deep learning, uh, Spark. Um, they've got it, they're all dealing with a wide variety of data formats, so the data is sitting around all kinds of formats and needs to be uh, ingested into these different frameworks. There are different ways of approaching model selection, cross-validation, even building pipelines. And, and all of these tools are typically in play and in use in, you know, in any given scenario, in any given organization um, and team. And finally, that entire workflow is only a small piece of the puzzle. So I really like this, this image, which is from a, a Google paper, The Hidden Technical Debt of Machine Learning. Um, and it really illustrates that, that machine learning code, while critical to uh, you know, the intelligent application and to the, the business use case and uh, adding a lot of value, is really just a small percentage of the overall picture. And in particular, we need to worry about how is that code in integrating to the serving infrastructure? How are we getting it from that training to, uh, to production and deployment, which is what we're going to talk about today? Machine learning deployment. So machine learning deployment covers a few questions, three uh, important ones, which is what are you deploying? You know, what is the model that we all talk about all the time? Where are you deploying it? What is that target environment, uh, the runtime? Is it uh, for batch inference, streaming inference, real time, a combination? And how are you deploying it? You know, this is the DevOps deployment mechanism. Um, exactly what is the, the details of, about how you taking that model and, and putting it into production, serving frameworks. So all of these are important questions, but we're, not, we're really going to focus more on the, uh, the what today, um, and perhaps a little bit about the how. So what is a model? Everyone talks about machine learning models, and when we say a model, typically what we think about is, okay, I've trained a logistic regression, and that's my model, right? That's my, my algorithm, uh, or it's my, my deep learning architecture, my, my, my neural net, my image classifier. But really, Almost no machine learning algorithm actually takes raw input um, and spits out a, a result. They need to operate effectively on, on vectors or tensors, so they, they need to operate on a numerical representation. And even though the common perception of deep learning is that it can operate on raw data and there's no feature engineering involved, that's also not true because even in the, the simple case of image classification, you typically need to do some pre-processing to that image, you know, resizing, cropping, and so on. So there's always this, uh, this pre-processing step which has to take some form of raw data and raw features um, in the form of categorical variables, text, uh, raw images, and pre-process it and transform it into a form that is actually usable to train the model. But before we've even done that, we've actually got to start right back at the beginning from that raw data um, and joining those disparate data sets together, transforming the, the raw data uh, and extracting features from the data uh, using feature extraction techniques to combine features and create new features. So there's a whole uh, set of steps that come before that, that model training. So at training phase, we need to apply all of those steps to the raw data to get to the, the model. We then make predictions and uh, up, update the model weights using some optimization technique until it fits the data really well. Now, if we don't apply those exact same steps at prediction time, then we're not going to have any model that is useful. It's going to be complete garbage. You know, garbage in, garbage out, and if we're not uh, following that exact same st set of steps and transformations that come before prediction, uh, we're not going to be successful. So deploying a model is all about deploying a pipeline and not just a machine learning model or a trained machine learning algorithm. So deploying the model part is just simply not enough. That entire pipeline must be deployed. So the data transformations that came right at the beginning on raw data, all the feature extraction, feature engineering and combinations, uh, the pre-processing steps, of course the machine learning model itself, which is important. Um, and then often overlooked is actually the, the uh, inference result transformation or prediction transformation. So typically a business a user doesn't really uh, care about tensors, they don't know uh, what a, a vector of, um, of numbers may, may or may not mean. That vector of, let's say, class uh, probabilities and, and, uh, and predictions in a classification problem needs to be applied, uh, you need an inverse transform applied to get that into, back into that kind of domain knowledge or that, um, that, that raw data space so that you can uh, associate, for example, the, uh, the actual class labels with those numbers and do something useful. So that entire pipeline um, needs to be deployed as one unit and it needs to be consistent between training and, and test time or training and inference time. And even ETL pieces of that uh, process and, and ETL steps in that pipeline are actually a part of it. 
So fortunately for us as practitioners, we have pipelines available in many machine learning frameworks. You know, Scikit-learn and SparkML are, are prominent, also TensorFlow and, and R. Um, and these frameworks allow, make it really e you know, much easier for us to chain these pieces together, uh, train them on data, and then get back a, a kind of unit that we can then deploy. So all of those, um, all of those frameworks make it a little, little, little bit easier to deploy pipelines. But we still have many challenges, right? So we need to bridge all of these gaps between languages and frameworks. Um, the data scientists and you know, machine learning researchers may be using Python, R, uh, they do a lot of things in notebooks. Maybe they're using a bit of you know, Scala with Spark. But your production environment is often wants to uh, use a compiled language for performance, so Scala, Java, C, Go, Rust, perhaps. Um, frameworks, I mean, there, there are too many to count, and, you, and you, you're typically in any medium to large organization going to see all of them. And everyone wants to use their, you know, their latest and greatest version and their latest and greatest uh, framework. You're, you're going to have to manage all the dependencies of these uh, different frameworks and components and pieces and versions um, of, of both your frameworks and your models. And the performance characteristics can really vary widely across these, uh, these dimensions. So a model in R or Python, raw Python, kind of may be not that performant, um, but it may be you know, extremely performant if it's wrapping uh, you know, C++ or TensorFlow code or PyTorch or something like that on GPUs. Uh, so it's really difficult to reason about what is the performance of, this, of, this, of each framework and each um, you know, machine learning pipeline going to be up front. So then, in, a sa in the same way that you have to bridge all these languages and frameworks, you have to bridge these teams that we, that we saw earlier. And each team has different objectives and different needs and goals. So data scientists and researchers always want the latest and greatest. They may want to be deploying models you know, off the TensorFlow master branch because it's got uh, some new you know, version of an RNN or it's got some, some new transformation or some performance improvement. Okay, production engineers really don't like that, right? Um, they care about having control, stability, minimizing changes. They don't like to be woken up at two in the, in the morning with a pager because the server's on fire. And the business user doesn't care about the details, right, uh, when it comes to the technical details. So you know, they don't care that you're using TensorFlow, you know, PyTorch Keras, whether it's running on Kubernetes. All they care about is that it's up, it's working, and what is the impact on, on the business? What are the metrics that we care about? So in the same way that we have to have this proliferation of uh, languages and frameworks, with that comes formats. Each framework has its own format. You know, so they are sort of open source but non-standard. Uh, you can go and look at what they are. You know, MLeap, Spark, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch. They all have their own internal format for representing uh, models, for saving them, for saving pipelines, for exporting them. Uh, you, of course, have proprietary formats, which um, may be you know, very performant, but they pr completely lock you in to one particular product. And then we have open source, open standard, which is what I'll be talking about today, including uh, PFA. So this lack of standardization leads inevitably to custom solutions. There's always uh, custom code. Um, and where some standards do exist, often the limitations of those standards lead to custom extensions. So, and the minute you extend a standard with uh, some, some custom uh, component or plugin that is non-standard, you lose all the benefits of standardization. In the, and you know, there's no point in doing it in the first place. So this is a, a general talk on ML pipelines, um, but Spark is important here because it, it, uh, it sort of sparked the work, so to speak, that we did in PFA export. So Spark solves many problems, um, and this, you know, this can to some extent apply to you know, other, other pipeline frameworks like scikit-learn, for example, in that each component within Spark, you know, Spark data frames, um, Spark ML, the streaming components, allow you to use one holistic system to manage all of these different uh, parts of the, of, of the pipeline. Uh, all, all, and all of the different teams can all, you know, use one API effectively, one set of APIs, uh, which is really great. But it in introduces additional challenges. And again, these are not completely um, unique to Spark, but certainly exacerbated. Um, so the main thing, the main problem with uh, trying to score models uh, built with Spark ML is that there's a tight coupling to the Spark runtime. So that introduces uh, two problems. The first is uh, you have to manage a lot of complex dependencies. So in order to score any model, you have to actually go and deploy a full Spark you know, uh, deployment or, or instance. 
which, yes, it may be running on one instance locally as Spark Local, but you still have to worry about a lot of compatibility versioning issues um, and a lot of dependencies that are uh, and potential dependency conflicts that are you know, pulled in for no particular, particularly good reason. Um, and probably more important, that scoring models for Spark in real time is really slow. So it's optimized for um, batch scoring um, and for scoring over data frames or streaming. I mean, this is changing a little bit with the, with the you know, new streaming uh, optimizations in Spark, but certainly the overhead of data frames with respect to task, task scheduling and query planning um, are just not suitable to real time. You know, so if you, if you need a few milliseconds to up to maybe a few hundred milliseconds of latency, uh, you're just not going to achieve that. And then, in addition to that, you have to do a lot of custom work just to get Spark models out, so out of Spark. So uh, if you want to avoid these, you have to export those models into some sort of custom format using custom export you know, uh, formats or, or readers. Um, and you then have to either export that uh, saved model you know, into a... Uh, into a custom machine learning framework for scoring, or uh, you, know, you have to write some sort of wrapper or, or, um, or converter into something like scikit-learn if you can. So everything ends up being custom, everything ends up being slow, and there's a lot of complexity. So before we talk about open standards, I'll mention you know, one solution to this which is becoming very popular, and that's containers. And uh, you know, containers have seen a lot of success um, and wide adoption in you know, software deployment in general, and certainly for machine learning software. Uh, so it provides you a lot of benefits. You get this repeatability and ease of configuration. Uh, you know, in theory, that if, if something works in, in Docker on your laptop, it'll work in production. Um, and it, it allows you to have the separation of concerns between data scientists and production engineers. So the data scientists can focus on their favorite framework. What is the model that they're training? You know, what is the, the what of the model? Um, and the production uh, engineers, the DevOps environment running Kube clusters and, and all of that, can focus on how, you know, how it is deployed and managed. And they don't, each one doesn't really have to worry about the other. But that's not entirely true because what goes in the container is still the most important thing. So as I mentioned before, performance can be really variable across these, these different dimensions of a language framework, version, et cetera. Um, and to do this correctly still requires good DevOps knowledge, pipe, you know, deployment pipelines, continuous integration and testing, good practices. And most importantly, it doesn't solve this issue of standardization. So if you can throw anything into a container and throw it over the wall, uh, that's all very well for, you know, for easing deployment from a technical perspective. Okay, you just push a container onto your kube cluster, but it doesn't tell you how to consume that, you know, that new microservice in your business application. There's no standardization that makes that easy. So it ends up, you, know, you end up having to go and inspect what's running in that Docker container to figure out how do I even call this model, um, what format, input format does it expect, what does it give me back? So th there's no standardiz standardization with respect to the formats um, and what's in the container or the APIs exposed. So you still have to write or use some complex serving framework on top of that. So on the formats uh, issue and problem and the, the aspect of standardizing uh, model formats, um, I'll talk about the portable format for analytics as a solution to this. So PFA uh, is being championed by the Daily Mining Group, of which IBM is a founding member. Um, and the DMG previously created PMML, PMML, which is the Predictive Model Markup Language. Um, that, that's an XML-based standard, which is uh, arguably the only real kind of viable sort of open standard in use today. And it ha has wide adoption. Uh, it's used for, for many you know, traditional machine learning applications. Um, but it does have many, uh, many limitations. And the key of the limitation of PMML is that if something is not in the spec, if, if a certain model or transformation that you want to use is not baked into the spec, um, you, can't, you simply can't use it. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, to extend things without, uh, in PMML without having a, a custom extension. And the minute you have a custom extension, again, you lose all of that benefit of having a standard. So PFA was created by the members of the DMG specifically to address these shortcomings. And it's aimed to be um, a much sort of more flexible version of PMML in many ways. So it consists of uh, JSON as a serialization format. So instead of XML, probably a, you know, a little bit more modern JSON format. Uh, it uses Avro schemas for all type definitions. So uh, to define the input and output data types that you want to work with um, and that your, your model works with. Um, as well as the, uh, the, inputs to, the input types to various function calls. Uh, it's all done with Avro, so it's all standardized, very flexible and extensible. And what PFA does is it, is it codes the functions called actions, 
that are applied to each input to create the output. Uh, so that's using a set of built-in functions um, and language constructs, so it acts like a sort of mini language, um, as well as the ability to combine uh, various uh, built-in functions together in user-defined functions. So essentially, you can think of PFA as a, a mini functional math language with a schema specification attached to it, a type system. So because you have this type system, um, and it, it's effectively sort of strongly typed, uh, it means that any valid PFA document can be loaded by a, a compliance scoring engine, and it can be verified at load time that it, is, um, that it will execute correctly and give you the correct result. So you don't, you know, you may have certain runtime errors, but you eliminate a lot of uh, the potential run for runtime errors using this uh, approach. So what this gives you is true portability, true separation of concerns from the model producer that is exporting that model from the, uh, the pipeline, and the model consumer, which is your production environment or your API, your business application. So it's portable across languages, frameworks, runtimes, versions. If you have a compliance scoring engine in PFA, you don't care where the PFA model or, or document, as we call it, came from. Uh, as long as it uh, meets the spec, you can execute it. So I'll give you an, a, a simple example of multi-class logistic regression. So the key components here is we want to specify the schema, so the input and output that this model operates on, and then the action, which is the, you know, the core model logic. So as you can see here the, uh, on the top left there, you have an input and an, and an output, and in this case the input is a, a double array, so a feature vector, and the output is just a number double, and this would be the predicted class. And on the right we have the action, and uh, the JSON representation is, is really meant to be human, uh, you know, operated on by machines, but it is human readable, it's a little bit verbose. But essentially what it's doing is kind of very similar to what you might do in Python code. You would first do a vector dot product um, and add a bias, which is exactly what the, the, the model dot reg dot linear function actually does. It takes that input vector, which is referenced uh, as an array, and it, um, the other argument to that function is a cell, which, which is the model coefficients. Now in the cell, we'll talk about in, a, in, a, in the next slide, uh, the cell is, 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 the, is a form of data storage. So the, data, the cell there is storing the, the, uh, the coefficient vector and the bias. So it performs that dot product, it's a, it's a, it's a syntactic sugar and, and a little helper function to do that for us. We could actually break it down into individual functions if we wanted. And once you've got that, we do a softmax, uh, we do an argmax on that vector, um, and we end up with the predicted class. So while a little bit more verb verbose, it looks very similar to what we would actually do in, you know, in a language like Python. So I mentioned cells, and what are they? So the, in PFA, the data storage is specified by cells and pools. Cells are a lot more common. So a cell is effectively an, a named value. You can think of it as a sort of key value pair. Um, and it, it acts as a sort of global variable during the execution uh, of each PFA document. So each time you, you, you do an execution or uh, your run of that PFA document, it'll perform th that set of actions that we saw before on the input, and it'll return an output. Um, and at the start of each run, that cell value is, is effectively immutable between runs. So that cell value is available um, as, a, as a sort of fixed value at the beginning of the run. During the course of execution of that action, you can update the cell value, so you, you, it, it is mutable within an action, within an exe a specific execution of a PFA document. So in this case, here's an example of, uh, let's say we're doing text processing, uh, and we want to, to convert um, text into you know, a bag of words or something like that. What we need is a vocabulary mapping. So we need to map the actual, uh, each term or, or, piece or word to uh, an index in a vector. And for that, we want to use a map. And we can see here that we've got a, a vocab mapping cell. Um, and it has uh, a, def a type definition, which in this case is going to be an Avro record, um, and the record has a field, which is then um, a map, and then it's, a, it's a map from you know, string to integer. It also has an initialization value, and that init value uh, at the top there, which is circled, would be the state. So cells are a way to, to store the, the model state, whether it's coefficients or vocabulary mappings or you know, uh, vector normalization values, anything that we want to typically use in a machine learning pipeline or analytic pipeline that has states that we need to apply uh, is stored in cells. Pools are a very similar concept, but they, um, they are actually mutable across action e execution. So you can think of them as uh, very similar to cells, but they're like a database field that can be updated you know, in, a, in a kind of um, 
atomic fashion, uh, and they're shared across all models um, and all executions of that model. So, so some other features of PFA uh, are the special forms, um, and that is effectively making PFA act like uh, much more like a little mini language. So you have control structure, you know, loops and conditionals. You can create local variables and update them. Uh, you can have user-defined de user functions that uh, com you, know, you can create your own arbitrary functions using any of the built-in functions effectively. Uh, casts, null checks, um, some very basic error handling, um, but extremely basic. And it has a comprehensive built-in library. So on the, on the right there, you see uh, the built-in function library. And for example, you know, string proce processing is a big part of uh, your typical feature engineering and extraction and machine learning. So it has comprehensive string processing functions, much like you would find in any language, you know, like Python or R or Java. So what is the current status of PFA? Uh, the spec is, uh, is sort of at the 1.0 um, level or status. It is, it's still evolving, it's still young, um, but it is fairly well-rounded in terms of spe specification. Uh, a member of the DMG who is very uh, involved in the initial creation of uh, PFA called Open Data Group has created reference implementations uh, in the Hadrian project, so that covers Python, R, and Java. Uh, so it, it provides export and a sort of domain-specific language in Python and R. Um, and covers scoring in Python R and the JVM. Um, so what does PFA do well? You know, it, it really has strong support for traditional machine learning. So as you saw in, in the previous slide, we've got a, a whole bunch of built-in functions um, that are really suited to your traditional analytic and machine learning applications. Uh, it, it allows control flow, usability, and, and, and um, or flexibility and composability using a functional approach and user-defined functions. And this type system allows strong verification uh, at runtime. But there are limitations. So at the moment, there's no built-in support for generic vectors, so mixed, dense, and sparse, which I'll mention a little bit later. No support for generic tensors or any of the typical kind of deep learning operators uh, that one needs in, in that space. And there's some open questions around industry usage and adoption, although that is growing, uh, and as well as performance. So I mentioned Spark ML in particular earlier, and some of the, you know, the, the shortcomings and issues around exporting Spark ML pipelines for production scoring. And it was this uh, gap um, and this need that led us to create the Aardvark project. Uh, so I'm from South Africa, uh, and an Aardvark is a, is, is a uh, translates to an earth pig. So it's a, it's a wild animal, kind of like an anteater. Um, and Aardvark is a bit of a play on, play on words there. Uh, so this is PFA export for Spark ML pipelines. Now the Hadrian project uh, has, has a JVM uh, engine for scoring PFA. Uh, but not much support for actually exporting models or creating PFA documents. So we created in Artvark a, a Scala DSL for exporting uh, PFA documents. It uses Avra for S and JSON for S, uh, and then Artvark Spark ML component for using that DSL to export models to Spark, uh, from Spark to PFA. Sorry. So on the right, we see a recreation of that example that we saw before uh, for multi-class logistic regression, and that's how it looks in the, in the Scala DSL. So we define cells, we define what the, the, the input and output uh, uh, data types are, and we define what the action is using uh, the DSL. So it starts to look a lot more like you know, native Scala code and a lot more fluid. So some of the challenges um, that we ran into uh, with SparkML in particular, um, but that highlights some of the issues in, in, uh, in Artvark. One of them is that we uh, I mentioned this generic uh, vector support. So uh, in Spark and, and similarly in kind of scikit-learn using NumPy, SciPy arrays, uh, you can operate on dense and sparse vectors without worrying what they are, and it'll do the right thing if you have mixed vectors you know, in an operation like dot product or addition or something like that. Um, PFA doesn't allow you to, to do that, so it, it results in you know, really kind of complex um, and quite hairy uh, workarounds and code and doesn't fully work. So that's a, a you know, shortcoming that needs to be addressed. Um, the question of combining the components uh, into a pipeline is, is, is quite tricky. Uh, so we had to do a bit of work around that, um, you know, trying to kind of match Spark's data frame operation as much as possible in the sense that it takes, uh, it transforms rows of data effectively in a data frame and it, it typically updates or appends columns. So we try to match that by taking uh, Avro records, which is so very, very analogous to a kind of row with fields or columns, and you know, effectively copying that record and adding a field each time. So it becomes a bit verbose, but so far it's the best way we've found to do that. Um, 
And then the, another issue is that Spark ML, you know, once you've trained a model, that model itself has no knowledge of schema. So it has some functions that where you can pass in the input data frame and you get out an output data frame that you can then analyze that data frame schema to figure out what's going on. You know, what are the input and output types that you need to work on and, and what, is, what are the columns involved? But um, that's fairly kind of cumbersome and adds a few extra steps to export. Um, and it's not that convenient. So uh, it would be nice if a Spark ML model was a kind of, um, you know, once trained was a, uh, you know, a, a set type um, or had a set type or a way to, you know, introspect itself and know what are the input and output types that I've been trained on and, and, uh, and provide that as an API. So Artvark is open source. We released it uh, in June and yeah, you can go and find it at github.com forward slash code A forward slash Artvark. Uh, the coverage at the moment covers almost all predictors in Spark ML, uh, many feature transformers, pipeline support, uh, equivalence tests between Spark and PFA, and some tests for the core DSL. Uh, we obviously need you know, more help to, to, to round it out and to look beyond, uh, beyond just Spark and you know, looking at scikit-learn and other LightGBM, XGBoost, and other popular uh, frameworks and libraries. But it's interesting to see that there's, there's starting to, to get, uh, you know, to have increased adoption in the open source community. So Salesforce released Transmogrify, uh, which is a, an auto ML toolkit for Spark ML. Uh, and for their local scoring they, and model export, they're using Artvark to do export to PFA and Hadrian uh, to score those models. So it's interesting to see you know, other, other projects starting to pick this up. Uh, and if you're interested, please go and check it out and, uh, and give us some feedback. So I'll very briefly mention um, other, other open standards out there. PMML, I mentioned before, is the, the precursor in many ways to PFA by the data mining group. There's a lot of support out there for frameworks, um, scikit-learn, R, XGBoost, LightGBM, SparkML, uh, but it has this, this shortcoming that anything that cannot be represented in PMML uh, can only be done by custom plugins, and then you, you, know, you lose the benefit of standardization. There's no point, really. Uh, MLEAP is, is a project which um, was developed by CombustML, a startup, to export SparkML pipelines to, uh, to a, a format for, um, to, the, to their own format for model scoring. So it has really good performance and it has really good uh, coverage, but it's really not a standard. So it is, it's an open source standard, uh, open source format, sorry, but it's not a, it's not a standard. Um, so, it, and it forces, forces this tight coupling between uh, versions of the model producer and the model consumer. So every time that your Spark uh, framework version has to be upgraded, so you have to upgrade your scoring engine in MLEAP, uh, which is not the case for something like PFA. And uh, finally, the Open Neural Network Exchange, or ONIX, uh, is really interesting. Um, it's a protocol bu uh, buffer-based format for exporting uh, neural networks, and it's focused on deep learning, so it has really good support for deep learning. Um, in many ways, similar to PFA in the sense that it serializes the, uh, the machine learning model and the, the state, as well as the functions or operators that happen uh, on that, that input to create the output. Uh, but at the moment, it has very poor support for traditional machine learning. So there is some support in the standard, but there's actually no support in, um, in the actual scoring engines out there. So this is something that may change, but at the moment, for kind of traditional machine learning, or let's say non-deep learning machine learning, uh, the support is limited. So finally, a quick note about scoring performance. Uh, we compared PFA with Spark and, and MLEAP, um, and we did it we did a, a comparison on a test data set of 80,000 records with string indexing, effectively categorical uh, feature indexing on 47 columns. Um, and then we then assembled those vectors together with some numerical columns and did a linear regression. So the spark time per record was actually 1.9 seconds, um, which is you know, off, the, off the chart literally, so we didn't put it on. And we can see there that um, MLEAP is, is still a lot faster than PFA, so it's about sort of almost three times as fast. Uh, but they're both still real time, you know, less uh, one millisecond or less. Uh, so this highlights that there is some work to be done in uh, in, in the PFA, which I'll mention briefly uh, in the next slide. So in summary, PFA provides an open standard for model deployment um, for a serialization of analytic workflows, true portability across languages, runtimes, frameworks, and decoupling the model producer from the, the model consumer. And as such, it solves a significant pain point in the machine learning community. Certainly, starting, we started with Spark ML, but this applies to, you know, to everything out there, R, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, LightGBM, and all the others. Um, but there are still risks. PFA is a, a young standard. It's still sort of gaining adoption. Um, as we saw, production uh, at scale it has not really been tested. 
And there's certainly some open questions around performance. Can that scoring engine be optimized for PFA? And what about deep learning? It doesn't support you know, the deep learning operators, so there are limitations there. There's no technical reason it can't be extended to support deep learning. It's just that it's not in the spec at the moment. And you know, it's a significant amount of work to do, and it hasn't been done yet. Um, but that is still an open question. And finally, a standard has many, uh, many positives, but one of, the, one of the negatives is that it can move really slowly, and it's kind of designed by committee. So once it's, once it's released, it can be quite difficult to, um, uh, to, to change it. So finally, the future directions. We've done in Artvox uh, our initial work focusing on Spark ML. As I mentioned, we'd like to look at scikit-learn pipelines, XGBoost, LightGBM, performance testing, and adding more comprehensive performance tests, proposing generic implementations to the standard, uh, so generic vector tensor support, some improvements to uh, performance and schema definitions, um, and then finally looking at PFA for deep learning. So can it, the spec be extended to encompass deep learning, add GPU support, uh, deep learning operators, tensor support, uh, what is required there and, and is it feasible? And can it actually become you know, a, a holistic standard to cover both traditional machine learning as well as deep learning? So thanks very much. I encourage you to go and check out codeair.org to see all the other projects that our team is working on, including the model asset exchange and the fabric for deep learning. There's a couple of links there. Um, don't really have time to talk about them now, but please go and check it out. Thanks very much. I think we might have time for one or two questions, or... Uh... is how do you import actually these models to some other languages or, and I didn't see any right, so, um, solutions for that. The question is, you know, we're talking about export here, P uh, model export to, P to a PFA or some other format, but what about importing models? Well, uh, PFA itself um, can be used as an interchange format. It's not really designed for that. Um, much like, you know, PMML, Onyx, uh, and PFA are all at the moment really focused on the export phase. So the, the objective is to try and bridge the gap between all the different frameworks and languages and allow you to export them all to a standard format, which allows you to use one scoring engine to score them all. Uh, so at the moment, uh, you, you could hypothetically, and I mean, it, it's not that challenging, but you could do it, export a model, let's say, from Spark into PFA and then load that PFA model into, let's say, scikit-learn. Um, it can be used in that manner, but it's not really designed to be used in that way, uh, is the short answer. Um, so, you know, for, for, for data interchange um, or model interchange, I think that's still an open question. And there's no, you know, even Onyx has, has some goals in the future to allow, you know, to, to have that as an intermediate representation where, let's say, you could, you know, train a model in TensorFlow, export it into Onyx, and then, then load it into PyTorch and do transfer learning, right? That's the goal, ultimately, but that, that's, this, that standard's not there at that point. Uh, so short answer, you know, there's no real solution out there that I'm aware of. PFA could be used for it. Uh, it's no, not a, necessarily a technical challenge, but it's not really designed for that. It's designed for exporting from, you know, it's kind of a many-to-one relationship, exporting from many frameworks into one standard um, format and then loading that into a, a standardized scoring engine and executing inference. Anything else? Great, thank you very much. <laughs>